So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we have uh, Professor Vivek Kumar from Nehru University. He will be talking about locating uh, costs in India, their mechanism, genesis, and development by Abedkar. And I will actually ask uh, Kumut uh, now to talk a bit more about this particular paper and this particular um, guest, because this is, after all, your uh, your RAC uh, event. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, so uh, uh, hello everyone. So we have uh, today Professor Vivek Kumar, the chairperson at the moment in the sociology department at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. And uh, I can proudly say he, he was a, my teacher with whom I started studying sociology in 2013-14 and till my PhD this in some formal and if uh, we know the atmosphere of Jawaharlal Nehru University like you have one or two formal supervisors, but you have several informal supervisors who are very essential throughout the process. So for Vivek Kumar has been one among them and a uh, very foremost uh, figure in not only in sociology in India, but also in the public life of India, uh, both at the political level and also someone has, who has been long associated with the uh, social movement in studying it and participating in it in India. And uh, uh, during our discussion, we thought it would it is important to discuss uh, one of this uh, paper that Ambedkar wrote uh, while he was a student at the university, I mean at Columbia University. And uh, this paper he wrote uh, as part of a course which he studied with Alexander Golden Weiser. And as we know, Golden Weiser himself was a student of Frank was at Columbia, and the group works in a way that was totally uh, that was closely uh, um, um, working along with other uh, pragmatist thinkers at that time including john dv and several students of boas were influenced by john dv while they were students at columbia so uh, uh, that's why we thought it is important and also in the current scenario we see uh, uh, how caste has, uh, I mean, caste was already there as a global category, but the uh, uh, in different political movements, how it has come to capture the global imagination in contemporary times. So I thought it is important to go back to this paper as part of the intellectual history of Ambedkar, and that was written more than 100 years ago from now. So we thought we'll discuss this paper, and we asked uh, Dr. Philip from the sociology department here at Cambridge to uh, uh, to chair this session. Dr. Philip, as we know, is uh, engages broadly in the field of uh, social and political theory, has been engaging with works of Habermas, Tocqueville, and uh, American pragmatism. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, we are all looking forward for this session by Professor Vivek. And uh, so one thing just for the everyone in the in the discussion today that we will record this session, but the uploading part uh, is going to be only of the speaker's lecture. That is today, Professor Vivek Kumar. And uh, uh, those who are participating, maybe they can introduce themselves in the chat box while the session is going on. So we'll have a understanding who all have participated today. So yeah, so we can ask now Professor Vivek to begin the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Professor Silva and uh, Manali, and of course, my uh, friend uh, Kumut uh, for this opportunity uh, to engage you today. Uh, well, what is the time, Kumut? Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, 2, 2 5 p.m., so you have around 40 45 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think that will be more than enough to talk because this is. Uh, uh, this is a, a very, very important uh, article uh, as far as uh, Ambedkar is concerned. And uh, the importance is, of course, uh, the exact time period, if we see, uh, it was uh, actually 1917, uh, and it was also published uh, in the... Indian Antiquary, one of the leading journals of that time. 
And of course, we know that Ambedkar was 26 when he had written this article as a MA student. So I think the exact time period uh, is now at least 123 years, we can say. It. So in, uh, in, in that uh, context, 106 uh, years, if we look at the importance that why should we engage with this article at this juncture, I think it, uh, it is very, very prophetic statement which was made by Ambedkar in this very article in the very first page that uh, caste looks like a very local problem. And uh, the, the most important part is that if Hindus migrate to other regions of the earth, Indian caste would become a problem world over. And very recently, last Tuesday only, we found that Seattle passing a law against caste. And uh, we have heard uh, in Toronto uh, that a education group has already passed a law. It is being sent to you know, other uh, institution. And in London, of course, uh, in UK, we have seen that how the law was passed uh, among the lower house and it has been in the offing. There is a lot of debate going on. There is also a commission which is there. So uh, caste is in diaspora, Indian diaspora, and there are different shades of it. And therefore, I think it is very opportune time that we discuss this uh, institution. And therefore, uh, you know, I titled my paper, Locating Caste, its Genesis, Mechanism and uh, Development. Now, the second thing uh, about this uh, lecture, um, which Ambedkar uh, tried to argue that he started his lecture by a review of literature. And in that review of literature, he looked three authorities of that time who had work on caste, a French scholar, Senart, and uh, Senart had worked on caste. And Senart had argued that the basic characteristic of caste is purity and pollution. Uh, then Ambedkar went on to look uh, another uh, thinker and uh, he tried to argue that how uh, Nesfield tried to look about the caste. And Nesfield was talking about that there is a, a restriction on commonality or messy. That is one of the important characteristics of caste that people do not dine with each other or outside the group. And therefore, it restricts social interaction and uh, that creates a different group altogether. Ambedkar also has looked uh, the the another person that is Ketka, who was one of the indigenous authorities on the caste, and he tried to analyze that what is the characteristic which has been given by uh, <coughs> uh, Ketka. And Ketka was of the opinion that endogamy is the only characteristic, that means marrying within their own group is the only characteristic, which is a very important characteristic as far as Ambedkar is concerned. So Ambedkar wanted to argue that, look, we have to see how endogamy originated, is as an institution, how endogamy originated. And if we can trace the origin of endogamy, then we can really understand the caste. But 
as I was, you know, uh, talking about that, where is the mistake which was committed by the earlier thinkers, what Ambedkar has quoted? He says that all three writers have missed the central point in the mechanism of caste system. And their mistake lies in trying to define caste as an isolated unit by itself. So they carved out a group and then defined their characteristics, one, two, three, and that became the caste. But according to Ambedkar, this is a mistake because caste is a group within itself, no doubt, but it is a part of a larger whole, a larger system. So caste does not exist in isolation or a singular unit, rather it's a part of a larger system. Now, having said this, therefore, I think our work becomes a little bit more complicated that how to search that system. What is that system in which caste is located? And therefore, you know, if we really want to understand, we will have to read uh, other articles as well. And I have tried to look that, you know, these are uh, six other articles, which are very important. If, because Ambedkar did not write at that time, he was only a student, but as the time went by, he, tried to search and tried to create a very, very important uh, intellectual material with his research. And I think these articles will help us to locate caste. And that's what I've titled locating caste. Now, if we really want to locate caste, then we will have to look the system in which it is located. And for this, therefore, uh, we have to argue that what is the system in which it is located. For that, there are two very important articles. I have just given them. The Hindu social order, its essential features, and Hindu social order, its unique feature, which has been published, of course, posthumously, not during his time. <laughs> so these two articles will help us to understand and locate the uh, caste in this uh, situation. Now, uh, what is the essential feature of the Hindu social order in which caste is located? And Ambedkar was very clear to look at whether that this social order is a free social order or is it not a free social order? And then Within this free social order, what is the place of the individual? Individual uh, in this, whether he has rights or not. So Ambedkar says that, yeah, free, uh, free social order, now it is quite long after the French Revolution. We all know that free social order has equally equality, liberty, and uh, fraternity. Uh, but what about the individual? And uh, Ambedkar was trying to look that individual in Hindu social order is not a free agent. He is part of a larger whole. That means if he has certain capital or cultural capital to use both you, he, it is not his own achievement. It is because he is he is born in a particular group and therefore he has that cultural capital. And if he is under pressure, if he is excluded, it is also not because of his individual's doing. It is the uh, location in the social structure. Therefore, he is excluded. Now, society, uh, you know, uh, uh, according to Ambedkar, uh, if, if, if a society, uh, an individual relationship has to be understood, then 
society is not above the individual. And if the individual has to subordinate himself, it is because that subordination is for the betterment of the individual. And therefore, for Ambedkar, uh, recognizing the rights of the individual becomes a very important characteristic of an open social order, which he is saying that Hindu social order is lacking somewhere these openness now what are what is the you know what are the what are the characteristics which uh, hindu social order lacks in place of equality according to ambedkar it is graded inequality and uh, graded inequality is a very unique uh, element which is uh, research of Ambedkar because we have talked about equality, which is very simple, that people are uh, stratified in unequal resources or in other realms. But greater inequality is a very novel concept as far as Ambedkar is concerned. And if we want to elaborate, that means that in Indian society, there are four Varnas and there's a fifth also. Now, all these, these Varnas, though they are unequal as far as power, prestige, rights, privileges are concerned, but had it been a simple e inequality, then the lower order groups could have united together and toppled the system. But what is actually Ambedkar saying that though the Kshatriyas want to go up in the ladder equivalent to Brahmins, but they will not like the Vaishyas to come, the third order should come to equal to them. Or the fourth order wants to go up the ladder, but he never wants the fifth order to come to his level and therefore there cannot be a unity and there cannot be dismantling of the system and the hierarchy is maintained because no one is willing to give up his space or position and share his position to the other so graded inequality instead of equality there is graded inequality Second principle is the fixity of occupation. Fixity of occupation and continuance of hereditary occupation. That means there is no free will. Individuals in a free social order, individuals get the occupation according to their capacity and capability. But here, capacity and capability is not considered as a characteristic of defining the occupation. Rather, birth is considered to be the hallmark of the choice. Whether you know, whether you have capability, whether you have capacity, that doesn't matter. But if you're born in a particular caste or community, then you will do that. The last, the third characteristic, the third principle of the Hindu social order is that uh, it is actually fixation of the people within their respective classes. Even after the achievement, whether it is educational achievement or whether it is economic achievement, they cannot change their place and they will have to remain there. So in that context, actually, the unique, uh, the, the essential features of the Hindu social order, they are not equality, liberty, and fraternity. Rather, they are graded inequality, fixity of occupation, and fixation of the space. Coming to the second, you know, aspect, what is unique feature of Hindu social order? And unique feature further strengthens the location of the individual in the social structure. 
and that is why it is necessary to understand the unique feature of hindu social order now there are three unique features of hindu social order that is one worship of super human and we all know who is the superhuman with all privileges with all rights uh, without any duty and uh, in hindu social order according to ambedkar the worship of superhuman is basically and you know uh, what is very important to read ambedkar ambedkar actually ambedkar was you know uh, reading uh, that uh ambedkar went on to read nietzsche and ambedkar quoted nietzsche that nietzsche has read manu manu and he says that you know uh, uh ambedkar compares manu's dictum of worship of superhuman with the hindu social order and he says that the way superhuman uh, worship is in hindu social order similarly nietzsche had laid down and nietzsche had written that in antichrist he had written my feeling are quite and i am quoting it from uh, ambedkar's uh, volume my feelings are quite reverse when i read the law book of manu an impeccably intellectual and superior work that is the uh, that is the eulogy eulogy that uh, nietzsche presents for manu who is laying down the social order and in which that is the unique uh, feature of hindu social order that superhuman has to be worshiped the second unique feature of hindu social order is technique devised to preserve the uniqueness of hindu social order now what is the technique which has been devised to preserve the uniqueness of the hindu social order there are two very important devices one making king responsible to maintain and preserve the social order as i think everywhere and second denying the right to education and right to use arm now if you do not have education then definitely the power of questioning the power of assertion goes away and if you don't have arms you cannot lift arm then again there cannot be a rebellion and in this way the uniqueness of the social order can be maintained and last but not the least the sacredness of the social order has to be maintained the order is considered to be divine and therefore it cannot be challenged now these are the principles the unique principles on the basis of social order is so when we are you know understanding the caste we cannot understand the caste on a uh, individual basis or as an independent institution we have to locate caste in the social order that is hindu social order with its essential features and with its unique features then and then only we will be able to look that yes there is this hindu social order now having said this how did how did hindu social order according to ambedkar manu tried to create or try to construct a social order now if you look this that usually the sociologists have talked about that hindu social order is divided into four varnas varnas are theoretical and then we go into the caste but ambedkar's reading of hindu social order is a little bit nuanced and that is why i think his uh, understanding of caste becomes very different now to broadly if you see that he uh, manu tries to divide the social structure into two and then there are four different varnas and within this we have a uh, further division so the division is such 
but without any untouchability. So untouchability was not born when the social structure was being looked by, uh, by Manu, that is 400, before 480, that is the time when Manu is trying to construct this social order. Now, having given the social structure that we have social structure, individual is placed, you know, Ambedkar goes on to look that, look that the social structure has to be looked from a Varna model. Varna model has to come into existence before coming to the caste. We need to understand the Varna model. What is Varna and when the four Varnas are born? Because Ambedkar is of the opinion that there were till the uh, till the Saptap Brahmana, there were only three Varnas. Varna is not a very a simple category as which we are trying to make because Ambeka says that there were 10,600 richards, that is shlokas in Rig Veda. Rig Veda, there were 10,600 richards and out of that, one has been identified as Purushukta, 10th Mandala, 90th Richa, and that becomes the basis for social structure, fourfold Varna uh, model. Now, in this, we have to locate the fourth Varna. I think that is a very important uh, contribution which Ambedkar makes because uh, Ambedkar is saying that from the very beginning, there were no four Varnas. There were three Varnas only. It is only after uh, Satpata Brahmana that we start getting the fourth Varna. But, you know, what is more important for us that this four Varnas are not very simple categorization. People take it that, look, it is hierarchical and therefore uh, we can simply say that these are four Varnas and they are hierarchically arranged. But I think uh, Ambedkar is of the opinion that, that things are not so simple. And why it is not simple? The problem is that how penal, how penal codes have been, you know, established by Vedic authorities at that time or codification has taken place that if you break the law, what will happen to you? What can happen to you? There are penal laws, and therefore, this categorization is not very simple categorization. Uh, having given you that Varna is a important, you know, uh, 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 it's important basis for categorization of Hindu social order, Ambedkar uh, argues that the fourth Varna is there fine, but how comes the fifth Varna comes? Because people argue, uh, Duma, Duma had argued that there are four Varnas and there cannot be fifth. Even Manu Smriti says that there are four Varnas and there cannot be fifth. Then how does the fifth Varna has come into existence? And, you know, I want to raise this question here that there are four Varnas, there are four Ashramas, uh, that is destination of the life, and there are also Dharmas. Now, if there is, there are four Ashramas, there are four Dharmas, or there are four Varnas, then what Dharma will fifth Varna follow? That is a mystery which is not answered by any sociologist. And therefore, I am forced to argue that is social order is also, Hindu social order is a construct. How this meta-narrative of Hindu social order is created, is it handiwork of sociologists or intellectuals, or this is an empirical reality? Because we know that even fourfold order does not exist 
at a pan India level. It is much more in the northern cow belt, as they say. Even within northern India, Punjab doesn't have that you know, category or Haryana, Punjab, or if we go to uh, even west, we do not find. And south, of course, there is no such category. So how this meta narrative of Hindu social order with fourfold hierarchy was constructed is anybody's guess. Now, after Varna, I think the location becomes very clear. And that's where I think Ambedkar's uh, thesis on caste is, starts emerging. A very interesting you know, thesis which he talks about is that caste, uh, as I have just argued in the beginning, that you know, when we have to understand caste, we have to understand that caste is a part of a larger system. But how Ambedkar looks at caste? According to Ambedkar in his essay, caste is parceling of an already homogeneous unit. And the explanation of the genesis of caste is the explanation of the process, how it has been parceled. Now, then he also gives another uh, you know, way to look at it, but it is important for us that we should engage that, yeah, after Hindu social order, after Varna hierarchy, we have to come to caste. Then and then only we will be able to locate caste. Otherwise, we will be only dealing or reading caste as an individual uh, institution or isolated unit. That is not correct way. Now, uh, Ambedkar begins by arguing that uh, what is the mechanism of caste? That is the first thing he tries to understand because uh, there were people who were trying to give characteristics of the caste and according to Ambedkar, those characteristics are not the real characteristic. The only one characteristic which Ambedkar thought and that was endogamy. And endogamy is the first thing which he's trying to argue is nothing but parceling of the homogeneous uh, unit. Now, in this context, Ambedkar went on to analyze that uh, 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 people will say that, look, uh, there has been endogamy in different uh, other parts of the world uh, among the different groups. Like uh, he gives example of, uh, he uses the term uh, at that time, uh, I will use Afro-Americans, but he uses the term Negro and whites, that how Negro and whites, they have married, but there is no caste, or what we call as tribe, uh, Indian uh, tribes there, they have also married, but there is no caste. But Ambedkar is very, very clear that the problem is those population, they have not become homogeneous as the Indian population has become. The homogeneity is the problem. And because of the homogeneity of the population, this parceling is very, very difficult to ascertain. So what is the mechanism which Ambedkar has tried to look to prove his point that there is an artificial parceling? Ambedkar goes on to look the, from anthropological perspective, a institution called exogamy. Ambedkar says that exogamy has been a very important characteristic in Indian society. And exogamy, whether actually it was Godra exogamy, Gotra means a mythical ancestor, tracing the uh, ancestry from a mythical ancestor, and is still uh, from father's side, five generations you cannot marry, and from mother's side it is seven generations. So that means Gotra exogamy is, is still practiced. 
and according to Ambedkar, this exogamy is remnants of the uh, uh, of the old order, the the primitive order, and Indian society presents primitiveness in its pristine and pure form. Still, there are so many remnants of uh, primitiveness in Indian society, and exogamy is one of them. Now, Ambedkar says that if exogamy has been the uh, institution, then how did endogamy emerge? And that is why he says that imposition, imposition of endogamy over exogamy becomes one of the very important characteristic of the mechanism of the caste. And then he tries to show that how this, uh, this uh, imposition of endogamy over exogamy has taken place. Now here Ambedkar has a thesis of imagery of a population. He is trying to imagine a population and he says that in every population, usually there is 50% of males and 50% of females. The, there is a clear cut divide of the individuals on the basis of sexes. And also there is a uh, proportional age-wise division as well. So there are you know, people who are marriageable age and there are kids and there are old people. So he has a lot of imagery at this level. Now, he has a theory of surplus woman and surplus male. That is another characteristic which he tries to evolve to prove his thesis that how imposition of uh, imposition of endogamy has taken place over exogamy. Now, for, for this, Ambedkar says that, look, if a group wants to close itself, and that is why he says that, you know, a caste is enclosed class. If a group that is a class wants to close itself, then what is the mechanism it will, uh, uh, it will acquire or it will adopt to impose endogamy over exogamy? Now, in this context, he says that, look, there is 50% of male in a group and a 50% female. They all have equal chances of marriage. But suppose a partner or a spouse dies, male partner dies, then what will happen to female? You cannot leave the female as it is because that can create a problem, moral problem in the society. And therefore, the givers or the lawgivers or the people who are trying to close their group, they found a way that he can be burnt alive with the male. Now, this is, you know, he says that it is basically a difficult task to burn, but there has been, he quotes Kumar Swami uh, and Kant Kumar Swami that how eulogies have been written on the satis in India, but nobody talks about the origin of the institution. Rather, they have actually glorifications the story of glorifications have been written by different authors, but nobody talks about how this origin. I will come to that later. But here he says that how you will dispose of this and that he says that that's where you can either burn her or you can keep her as widowed forever. And that's where widowhood starts emerging in the Indian society. But suppose female dies, then what are you going to do for the male? Now, because it's a masculine society, patriarchal society, he says that, you know, male is a uh, um, asset to the society and what will do? You cannot burn him. 
Therefore, what will you do? You can keep him as widower forever, but again, there is a moral uh, question. He can create, he can go uh, outside the caste and marry someone, or he can create a moral uh, problem by actually, you know, ha having an illicit relationship. And therefore, you have to tame him. How can you tame him? You can tame him by marrying with a, a spouse which is not yet attained puberty. And therefore, child marriage also started looking here. So he says that actually there are two ways to control the surplus woman. And there are two ways in which you can control the surplus male. Super, so the uh, surplus woman can be controlled either by sati or by widowhood. And surplus male can be either kept widower forever or he can be given a, uh, he can be married to a girl who has not yet attained the puberty. So that is the child marriage. So these are two mechanisms. He says that if we find, if we try to find out the history of these institutions, then I think we can ascertain that there has been a process of imposition of exogamy over endogamy. How endogamy has been imposed on exogamy. Now he says that, look, there is no written history of this in these institutions. But what is important for Ambedkar that these institutions speak for themselves. And institutions are there with certain groups. So he says that let us identify those groups where these practiced practices are being, you know, done. And these practices are still in pristine and pure form. And then he tries to zero down that Brahmins are the superior caste and they practice these institutions in totality. Or the other groups, the lower strata groups, they do not follow these institutions in letter and spirit, and there is no such uh, established institutionality in their society as well. And therefore, he is, you know, uh, of the opinion that the it were the Brahmins who first close the group, and that's where the caste or endogamy imposition of endogamy on exogamy is started to maintain their purity and also to maintain the surplus woman and surplus male equation. Now, that is the mechanism uh, Ambedkar has given uh, for the uh, caste. But what is the genesis? Ambedkar is trying to argue what is the genesis? And usually it is said that, oh, Manu created caste or it was Manu who was responsible for that, Ambedkar refutes that, no, it was not Manu who did. But yes, uh, Manu was responsible for only codification of the society, but not the caste. And therefore, we have to go into the, uh, uh, we have to go into the Genesis a little bit further uh, by uh, just a minute. By looking at the important, you know, sociologist, and he here quotes uh, uh, one French sociologist, Gabriel Tate. I think Gabriel Tade at that time, 1970, even he was much famous than. Uh, Durkheim, because Durkheim had not yet been established, but Gabriel Tarde's law of imitation, I think that is one of the very important characteristic in caste, that how caste is actually, you know, Ambedkar adds genesis and is spread together. And in that sense, when a group has a tendency to close itself, 
others found closed for themselves. So Brahmins were the first to close the group and therefore others found closed for themselves. Now in this context, therefore, Ambedkar says that once the group was closed and Brahmins being the highest, most uh, class, the imitation principle says that the lower strata imitates the higher strata. And in that context, the lower strata or the groups which were lower to them, they started imitating the highest group. And in that context, the caste started developing. Otherwise, you know, it was not in the uh, it was not in the uh, power of Manu because it is well developed area, and therefore, friends, I think uh, another important aspect which Ambedkar contests here is Varna Shankara theory, mixing of blood theory, which. Uh, Manu had tried to argue that, look, castes were born out of intermixing of the blood. I have given you the notion of anuloma and prat uh, pratiloma marriages, that anuloma marriages were there and because of proliferation of the caste has taken place. That means upper caste males or the lower caste males or upper caste females, when they got married, actually there was different caste. Ambedkar refutes this argument, saying that look, uh, you know, Manu is, uh, you know, that's what uh, the article uh, I have shown. Manu's madness. Ambedkar directly goes and talks about Manu's madness. That you know, Manu is casting aspersion on the character of the Indian woman. How can this such whole variety of thousands of you know, untouchables and thousands of shudras were born with this type of, you know, theory which Manu has given. The second theory is also very important, which Ambedkar refutes, is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the change from paternity to maternity. I think in the riddles of Hinduism, matra pitra savarnya, pitra, pitra savarnya, pitra comes from father, paternity. Now, earlier, the rule was the if in a anuloma marriage where the um, father is from high caste, the descent of the offspring will be traced from father's side, and therefore there was a osmosis, and the lower caste woman's offspring they went into the upper strata. But after Manu, Manu changed this order. And instead of uh, descent from paternity, he changed it to maternity. In Anuloma marriage, where father was from upper side, upper caste, and mother was from lower caste, the descent of the offspring will be traced from mother's side. Now, this created this created a discrepancy and the uh, the status of the lower strata woman started even going down, and degeneration of the Indian woman also started. Now, that is why I think, you know, Ambedkar's contribution to the caste and caste theory is something very noble and very original and doesn't fall into the category of the general sociologist. But the problem is that even Gure, who was in Mumbai at that time, and Ambedkar was in also Mumbai, and Ambedkar had written his text in uh, 1970, and Gure wrote his first book in 1936. But he did not refer even a single time Ambedkar. Amin Shuni was considered to be authority on you know, a caste, uh, was not even born at that time when Ambedkar had already published his article in Antiquary. When he writes caste uh, on caste, but he also does not take reference. So I think, you know, at this 21st century, when we are in a, 
uh, information revolution, global age, I think things cannot be suppressed. And the texts, they speak themselves with their uh, writer. I think that's why today I think this text is being read and reread and is making a very different, uh, you know, argument and contribution towards the development of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you.